Thank you for joining us for this message from More Life Church, where we exist to love God, to love people, and to reach a region for Jesus and to make a difference for generations to come. Now, to learn more about how we're reaching our community and how you can partner with us and learn how God has uniquely designed you, check out Grow Steps On Demand by visiting morelifechurch.com slash growsteps or by downloading our app today. But for now, enjoy today's message. In Luke chapter 5, if you want to follow along on screen or on your iPad or on your iPhone or with a physical copy of, of, the, of the scripture, this is what you'll see in Luke chapter 5, and I'm going to read 1 through 11. Ready? Uh, one day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. Watch what Jesus does. He got into one of the boats that the one belonging to Simon, who ended up becoming Peter for reference sake, he gets into the boat. So pause, partnership has already started. Jesus needs something that he doesn't have and he borrows what someone else owns and partners with them in the spreading of his message. So partnership just started jumping out at me, the power of this. Imagine, imagine with me The son of God needing something that he doesn't have, but you have. This is the case. You might think about God and say, well, he has everything that he needs. He doesn't need me. Then why are you here? He put you here on purpose for a purpose, has been said many times before. And there's something inside of you that I need you to understand this, that God wants to partner with you in the advancement of his cause. And there is something that I want you to see in this. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, who ended up becoming named Peter, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said, Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to to break. So they signaled their partners. I want you to say partner. So they signaled their partner in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full they began to to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats upon shore, left everything and followed him. I've titled today's message, The Power of Partnership, Skin in the Game. Skin in the Game is a very interesting phrase to me that I believe is a foundational component of partnership. And in this time, I want you to consider who and what will you partner with in your life in 2022. And if you're going to partner with this, with whatever you're thinking through, I want you to know up front, you must have skin in the game. What is skin in the game? It's being involved in something that costs you. Um, The earliest reference I could find to this thought and idea is in in the, the book, The Merchant of Venice by William Shakespeare. And there was a man who owed a debt and he didn't have any resources to pay the debt, and so he paid the debt with a pound of his flesh. This is beginning of the idea of skin in the game. Skin in the game means you are involved in something that costs you. It's sacrificial for you. You've given everything as they did in this text. They left everything and followed him. They had skin in the game. And this is what I'm going to encourage you about. There's an interesting passage of scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that describes this. Shows us that Paul had some skin in the game. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 28, watch this. Are they Hebrews, 
pause and look up here at me for just a moment. The word they is a group of people that had come after Paul. Paul went throughout all kinds of regions in that time and started churches all over. He was the apostle of a region and he, he began things, he started things. And after he started things, those things needed maintenance and management and something very interesting happened. People came along after him, in my own words, trying to ride on Paul's coattails, taking advantage of the hard work of the foundation that Paul had laid. And Paul, in his writing to the Corinthians, refers to them in this passage as they. And he calls them this phrase that is really meant to be as a kind of a snide comment. He calls them super apostles. And these individuals, I think you can, rel you can relate to today, um, these super apostles are the people who come into your life and they want authority but no responsibility. They want to say so, but they don't have skin in the game. They want to tell you how to do it, but they've never done it themselves. You'll pardon me if I preach a little bit this morning. I don't trust people who are experts in a whole bunch of things they've never done. Don't come and tell me how to build it when you haven't gotten off your couch and out of the living room yet. Am I in the right room today? Like, and I don't mean that in any other way except for when you're doing it and the people who are watching are criticizing, that can become an irritation. And this is what Paul's feeling, the irritation of people coming along, riding on his coattails, trying to take advantage of his hard work, and he sets the record straight. And he's basically saying, in my own language, he's got skin in the game, and he's about to lay out his case for that. And here's what he says. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? Watch this. I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I'm more than that, he says. He goes on making his case, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was beaten or pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea, I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, and in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. Some may say, that's a lot of danger. I've been late, I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. Every toddler, parent of a toddler understands that statement. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides all that stuff, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Paul says, in my own language, to borrow some languages current to our vernacular. I got skin in the game. I got a personal investment in this. And this is what I want to say to you. If you, are, if you are going to take me up on this offer to consider who and what you will partner with, and I want you to, because who you partner with will make a massive difference in your life. You have to ask yourself this question. Am I willing to have skin in the game? Write this down if you're taking notes, please. If you don't have skin in the game, you aren't in the game. You may know somebody in the game. You may be related to someone in the game. You may be an expert in the game. You maybe are a good commentator on the game. But I do not want you to confuse any of that with being in the game. What game am I talking about? I'm talking about anything that you're stepping foot in and giving your life to or saying you want to give your life to. Can I make it plain? It won't all be about church. But just because you go to church doesn't mean you're in church. Like, what do you have in the game in these areas of your life? Now, in case, in case you think I'm saying something I'm not, I'm not up here, me the expert, me judging you and saying you're not doing well. I'm asking you to think about your life and what areas of your life do you want to have skin in the game in and how will you move forward with that? I know there's lots of people for lots of good reasons. You don't have skin in the game in areas of your life because you did it and got hurt. You did it and got burnt. You're tired. 
you're worn out. But what I want to say to you on the beginning of this year is, this is the time for you to find some areas where you invest and have skin in the game. Doesn't matter if you like football or not, this will help you, I think, if, you, if I say it well. And um, yesterday, I'm a, I'm a huge Ohio State fan. I wasn't interested in yesterday's game at all. And my son manipulated me and pressured me into watching it. And here's what he said. He said, Dad, I said, I'm not interested. I wanna know, does anybody want to know the truth why? The truth is I was ticked that they got beat by the team up north. And so I was done. Like, I don't, I don't even care. They, I don't care what happens. My son says, so I had no skin in the game. I'm done. They're dead to me after that loss, right? My son says, Dad, does it matter that it's my last Ohio State football game as, a Ohio, as an Ohio State student. He got me. Okay, I'll watch it. So we watch it. Great game, interesting. Right before the game, um, several players for Ohio State opted out, went to the NFL draft. Surprised me, maybe not others. One of them was one of their best wide receivers, a, a, a young man named Chris Olave. And I read something after last night's game that really captured my attention. Chris Olave is elected to go to the NFL, so he forewent his opportunity to play in the Rose Bowl. This, now, now this, is, this, is where I, this is where it will happen. What I read astonished me. Chris Olave, who's going to be a multimillionaire in a few months, kept his skin in the game. And I didn't know this, but here's what the man did. He opted out. He wasn't going to be on the field. But this is what he decided to do. He stayed and he practiced with the team all the way up to the game and was at the game on the sideline rooting for his team. He risked a whole bunch. Why? He had skin in the game. He had a vested interest. He wanted to see that thing in a certain way through to the end. And I respect that. And I think it's something that you admire and respect about people too is that when people have a vested interest in something, they earn our respect. They earn our trust. When we know that they are committed to the outcome and making a difference, our respect for them goes up. And that's what I'm talking to you about. What will you commit to in this year that you're willing to give your life for. Now we use that and throw it around, but uh, let me read this, one of my favorite presidential speeches of all time. It's commonly referred to as the man in the arena. Theodore Roosevelt gave this speech, this is just part of it, April 23rd, 1910 in Paris, France. And this is what he said. It is not the critic who counts. Not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? who knows the greatest enthusiasm, the great devotions, who spends himself on a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat." I want to be like the man, the individual he describes in the arena. Listen, I'm not interested in the criticism if you don't have skin in the game. If you, if you get buckled by the pressure of criticism, may I come alongside you and help you with something that I've learned that maybe will, will help you as well? If someone comes and brings criticism to you and they have no vested interest in a positive outcome of change that they're willing to contribute to, ignore their criticism. If they don't have skin in the game, they've given up the right to be a critic if you don't pay attention. Leaders have to go first in this area. I think that's why I respect them and told that brief example of, of, the, of that wide receiver, of that player. Uh, skin in the game. I, I think that it's important in today's age and season that we have to highlight something that I believe is an enemy to skin in the game. 
And it is what I'll call a spirit of entitlement. Thinking you're owed something with no investment. Can I tell you in a world of social media and viral sensations, that hard work, you all know this, but I need to highlight it. Hard work still matters. Hard work still matters. Nothing is given. You got to work for everything you're going after. And if you become a viral overnight sensation, at least you did it with a spirit that was just, wasn't just sitting and waiting for something to happen. You had skin in the game and you were working and you were striving and you were doing everything you knew to do. There is a mentality that is getting stronger in culture that is adding to this pressure. And it's a, it's a, it's a mindset that says, just sit back and wait for this lottery moment to happen. And I need someone to know on this very first Sunday of 2022, I need you to know this. That lottery moment is not happening for you. I know. I know you don't. I know. This isn't stirring your soul. I'm not telling you as the pastor this is going to be your greatest year ever. Because I don't know if it's going to be. But I can tell you this. If you work hard and go for it and have skin in the game, things will work out. Things will work out. Or they won't. Either way, God is on the throne and hasn't changed his mind about you. See, our determination, whether as Christians, whether we put skin in the game, is not based on the outcome. It's based on our honoring his faithfulness in our lives. That's why we do it. Let me, let me illustrate skin in the game if I can a little bit further. Um, so one of the safest airlines in the world is the Israeli airline El Al. I don't know if I'm saying it correctly, but it's E-L-A-L. And as far as I know, um, that airline is the only airline in the world that does a few things. And after September 11th, they became like highlighted all throughout the world for their safety. And this is something that is very interesting about their security protocols. They do not outsource their security bag check employees. They don't have TSA. <laughs> Here's what LL does. The men and women who, if you're flying with them, the men and women who check your bags in the security protocols, they follow you and get on the same plane you do. That's skin in the game. How do you think the per you'd feel safer if you knew the people checking your bags were actually getting on the plane with you? Yeah. Right? They do a whole bunch of other things. That's, that's, in, that's, that's skin in the game. One of the things that's important that you understand is this. Skin in the game requires conviction, not personal preference. Often, personal preference masquerades as conviction, but isn't really, con isn't really conviction. We live in a world that's very high on personal preference. I want to make sure that I say this in a way that's understandable to you. Um, Personal preference is that, amongst other things, the leading cause of the division that human beings are experiencing with one another right now. You thinking it should be one way, and others thinking it should be another way. It's at the center of every husband and wife war is personal preference. Just as a trivial example, one of the very first battles that I waged with my wife in our married life, I lost, by the way, but it was over toilet paper. How silly and stupid is that? She said she was team over, I was team under. I lost that war, and for 25 years nearly, we've been a, we've been a household of over. Do you all understand what I'm saying? You're looking at me funny. Toilet paper all over. And this is, this is the thing. Personal preferences is something that, we go to war over. My wife and I have nearly 25 years of war stories. If you've been married longer than that, you have more stories. If you've been married less than that, you have hopefully less stories. But Angie and I, we didn't have language for it then, but I have language for it now to illustrate this idea. When 
personal preference wins out over conviction, that's the recipe for disunity and strife. It's your will against theirs. It's the fundamental error that parents make in parenting, that you think it is you saying no to a child, and if you try to battle a tug-of-war of wills with a toddler, I promise you, they will out-energize you. You will lose. Personal preference over conviction is, is a struggle that happens in church world where I like it this way and they like it that. People leave churches and leave companies and leave families over personal preferences. I wanted the wall blue and they wanted it gray. I wanted a leather couch and they wanted cloth. All of these things that we go to war over that aren't worth going to war over and all of this does is distracts us from having skin in the game. There's a man by the name of Jonas Yoder, um, an Amish an Amishman who um, decided that he was going to homeschool his children. Uh, he lived in the state of Wisconsin, and the state of Wisconsin didn't like that. And so the state of Wisconsin took him to court. They sued him. And so he was stuck in this battle, nearly bankrupt, lost everything for the most part. And his case was finally heard by the U.S. Supreme Court. And Jonas Yoder uh, against Wisconsin, or Wisconsin versus Yoder, I suppose is, is the correct way to say it, um, was, was the legal argument was about the First Amendment. And the Supreme Court ruled in this case that the First Amendment is not about you being able to exercise your personal preference. It is there for you to be able to live out your religious conviction. And so the court set out five things that were indicators of pressure, cultural pressure, that would help you determine if something is a preference or a conviction. I wanna give you those five to make this point. So that you, as you sort through your life, can ask yourself right now in this season, I don't know how much more plainly to say it, but we're go I'll go back in my own life. Pastoring nearly 20 years, as I rewind, I think about things that I went to war over with people that don't even matter to me now. If you, if you would self-examine and be courageous enough to go through and rewind and say, I went to war over this and now I don't even, I don't even care about it now. That was a preference, it wasn't a conviction. Watch these five things, these five pressures that you face on a regular basis. This will help you determine if what you're living out is a preference or a conviction. The first cultural pressure that the court outlined was family pressure. If your family can talk you out of the belief, it's a preference, it's not a conviction. If, if one meal over dinner with your dad can get you to not marry that person, that's not a conviction, that's a personal preference. If your mom can send you a text and cause you to go to a certain law school over another, that wasn't a conviction, that was a personal preference. If your family can talk you out of that situation, it's a preference, the court said, not a conviction. The second pressure was peer pressure. If your friends and colleagues can convince you to let go of that belief, it's not a preference. Or it's a preference, excuse me, it's a preference, it's not a conviction. The third type, was a pressure of a lawsuit. If the threat of legal action causes you to leave a belief, it's a preference, not a conviction. The fourth one is pressure of jail. If going to jail will move you off your position, the court said, it's a preference, not a conviction. Jonas Yoder, the, the court saw, had gone through all four of these and was committed, had skin in the game. They didn't make him do the last one, but they were convinced that he would have done this for his conviction. If the pressure of death will not change your mind, that's a conviction. Now, I want you to filter this if you can in your own life, and it's a, and it, and it's a big ask of me, but this is why. Conviction lasts personal preferences fade. I said it before, I'll say it again. The things you went to war over 
you look back and reflect now and say, that wasn't worth my energy and time. What I'm asking you is in 2022, put your energy to the things that you have a conviction about, not that you have a personal preference in. Have skin in the game. Money where your mouth is. Go all in. Like, I think this is the perfect time to have this conversation. You'll know who you want to do life with through partnership if you build that relationship on conviction, not personal preference. What that means is if your connection to a workplace or relationship or use church as an example, if your connection to this church or whatever church you're connected to is built on a conviction, then when, they, when you show up and a decision is made that you don't understand or you don't like, you'll stay rooted and grounded because it wasn't a preference, it was a conviction. You're like, I'm supposed to be here. This is my tribe. This is my people. This is where I have skin in the game. So many people jump from thing to thing. Marriage, job, church, decisions. Why? They don't have any skin in the game. It's easy to opt out of a 401 program when you don't have anything in it. It's easy to abandon a bank account with a three cent balance. It's easy to change a church when you haven't cried over it and bled with the people and served and gotten dirty in the muck and mire of challenges. It's easy to dismiss those things. It's it's easy to, to leave that. Can I, be, can I be honest with you for a few minutes? Not that I've been lying to you for the previous 25. Can I like get gut level honest with you? There were moments in my life, just like yours, when I wanted to quit on what I was doing. I wanted to quit. At the end of the day, do you know what the, one of the main things, and you, you, you can Jesus juke if you want and say, God said, which that's fine, or, you know, this is, this is what the Bible says, and that's beautiful. We should build our life on, the, on what the Bible says. But there's so many people that we're just not. At the end of the day, it comes down to where the rubber meets the road. And there was one time in particular where I'd had it up to here with everything going on around me, and I'm like, I'm done. I'm out. Years ago, wrote a resignation letter. I was ready to present it to the board. I was done. And I did two things. I went to my file that I keep of encouragement. I have an encouragement file. Every time you or someone like you has written me an email or a card or a note on the back of an offering envelope, or a prayer request that was sent to me in terms of encouragement. I take that card, I take that note, I take that whatever, that email, print it off if necessary, and I put it in a file. And that file has grown over the years, and I've never thrown anything away. Never thrown any of those away. And the first thing I did was I sat down and I made a, I made a decision. I'll never make, this was the decision that I made, I won't make any decision, good or bad, based on an extreme emotion. The worst time in the world to go buy a new thing is right after you got a little bit of a raise. The worst time to quit something is right after you got criticized or were told you didn't do a good job. When you're down and discouraged. I made, I made the decision. I'll never, make it, I'll never make a decision out of highs or lows. I sat through there and I read those notes of encouragement until I didn't feel like quitting anymore. And I made a deal with myself. If I ever get to the end of that file and read them all and still want to do something different, I'll do it. That's just a built-in thing for me. And I hope that you don't hear me saying something that I'm not. I'm just simply telling you, I'm human just like you are. This is a system. This is a protocol. This is a, a boundary that I've created in my life to keep me from making a stupid decision based on an extreme emotion. The second thing I reverted to was, Ange and I got skin in the game in this church. We got 17 years of history. 
17 years of crying. At one point, that, at that point in my life, Angie and I's personal property was on the line. I'm not telling you that to tell you a sad story. I'm trying to use it to tell you and illustrate skin in the game. We signed our name guaranteeing that we would pay the bank back if the church failed. And by the way, I didn't and don't own anything that I was signing on. I had all of the responsibility with no authority. And I was happy to do it. Why? Because I believe in this. It's a conviction. You got to kill me to get me to drop that conviction. That's what I'm talking about. I might be fortunate enough to have found something that is long-term and sustainable. Maybe you're in the middle of transition. Maybe, maybe you're reevaluating. And I want you to have something so deep down inside you that you partner with that death itself is the only thing that's going to separate you from it. Till death do us part. That's what I want for you. That's what I see for you. That's what I think is possible. Because listen, when you, when you have that, life becomes vastly more interesting, vastly more fulfilling. This is what God says about it in Colossians. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not human masters. Skin in the game. Where do you have skin in the game? Where do you have skin in the game? Where do you have skin in the game? I want that for you. I have a deep concern for humanity that we are losing the intensity and the value and the priority of investing in things bigger than us. This is not about money in case that's what you keep hearing. Let me just dispel that and break that belief and that mindset off with, with words. That's not it. What have you given your life to that at the last moment when you breathe your last, you'll be like, that's what I wanted to give every bit of energy and fiber and calorie to in my life. Like that's what I wanted to do. That's who I wanted to partner with. I lived it the way I wanted to live it in God's eyes. That's what I'm talking about. Thanks again for joining us for this message from More Life Church. Now, if this message spoke to you, we would love for you to share it with someone you think could use it. And finally, if you would like to partner with us financially, you can do that by visiting morelifechurch.com give. Now have an amazing day.